welcome to the virtual worship of King of Kings. Uh, we welcome all the uh, people from Lutheran Church of the Palms who have been worshiping with us these past several months. And we welcome all those other ones around the country who have been tuning in to hear the good news as we share it. Um, just a few brief announcements. Um, the last council meeting that we had, we voted that we were going to maintain the building being closed to activity until further notice, that there will be no activities taking place inside our facility. Um, that includes worship service, uh, music jams, any sort of Bible study, um, until we can start having our worship together again. And at that point, we will start to consider each different item. So that we've had an announcement put out, but I just wanted to reiterate that this morning. Pastor Marge, you have exciting news. Yes, I do. Uh, Lutheran Church of the Palms, they had their congregational meeting by Zoom. And I thought that was fantastic that we had this older crowd, but yet they were able to have 60 some households call in for the Zoom meeting, for the congregational meeting. And they did vote un unanimously to call Pastor Kelly Penzinger will be the new pastor down there, and she'll be starting the end of July, maybe the beginning of August. The date hasn't been set in stone yet, but uh, the call has been extended, so everyone is excited. So, you know, a unanimous vote, that's fantastic. Yes, it is, and I know you're a little excited about being able to re-retire for a short period of time. It, it's, it's mixed feelings. I am so happy that I was able to you know partner with them through this process and I did my job I completed my job and it was in a good healthy way that they're excited about extending this call to a new pastor sad because I did make a meet a lot of people and a lot of great people down there and I'm going to miss them so it is with mixed feelings well and you will get a chance you people from uh, Lutheran Church of the Palms to kind of say farewell we are going to do two drive-by communion services. We're going to do one here at King of Kings and one at Lutheran Church of the Palms. And when I say drive-by communion, that's all it's going to be. We will be saying the words of institution during our service here. And then from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock, you are invited to drive in it, the taste of King of Kings around the building and come through the portico connecting the church building and the fellowship building and you will be handed a, a wafer and a cup of wine without touching each other. You'll be asked to wear masks in your car. We will be masked and gloved and then you will close your windows in gesture elements and then if you want to pray we ask that you pull off into the front parking lot. Lutheran Church of the Palms will have the similar procedure, except you'll be coming in the further drive down Nebraska Lane. Well, it depends on which way you're coming from the church. It could be the nearer one, but it'll be the one that's farthest from the preschool. Right. And you'll be pulling through their portico, same. So we will probably walk down the line, do two or three cars at one time, so the windows can be lowered and then raised again. And then we say, we ask that you be wearing masks when you pull in, you can pull in and put your mask on right before you pull up, but we ask that you wear masks, we'll be wearing masks and gloves, and it'll just be for distribution of communion, and we'll be doing it from 11 to 12 o'clock. We'll be doing it here at King of Kings on July 12th, so that's two weeks from this Sunday, mark your calendars, and then three weeks from this Sunday, July 19th, we will be down at Lutheran Church of the Palms. Correct. So, drive by communion. 11 to 12 o'clock, King of Kings on July 12th, Palms, Lutheran Church of the Palms on July 19th. We will have this announcement going out to both our congregations so you'll get a hard right. copy of this. Right. And it'll also have all the protocols for uh, keeping safe, keeping us safe from one another and we don't spread COVID because it is peaking currently and I know in Pasco County, in this particular area, it's more than tripled in the last couple of weeks. So please stay safe. Right. But we thought if this works out well, that we might continue to do this maybe once a month, just so that we can, again, for that feel of being connected and being able to physically take the elements, because we know that's important for everybody. So I'm hoping this works out. 
So with that, shall we start our worship, dear? Yes, I don't have any announcements and you don't have any announcements. So, open. let us begin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the God of mercy, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, that we may live and serve you in the newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we've obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Please join with me in praying the prayer of the day. O oh God, God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading and only reading this morning is taken from the 28th chapter of Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. We continue with our reading of the psalm. Your love, O Lord, forever I will sing. From age to age my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your steadfast love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David my servant. I will establish your line forever. And preserve your throne for all generations. 
Happy are the people who know the festal shout. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your presence. They rejoice daily in your name. They are jubilant in your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. And by your favor, our might is exalted. Truly, our shield belongs to the Lord. Our King to the Holy One of Israel. Have you ever had that uncomfortable feeling when, when that guy or that girl joins in your conversation? You know, that person who for some reason just makes things awkward in their very presence in social settings. Maybe it's that person you work with, or that kid in school that you see in the hall every day, or that mom in your mom's group who, if you knew that he or she would attend, you'd probably get caught up with errands instead of attending yourself. You know, that person who, for some reason, just makes things unusually difficult. Do you know that person? Jeremiah is that person. Contrary to popular belief, Jeremiah is not a bullfrog. He is a prophet. He speaks God's word given to him by God for the benefit of God's people. But that's where it gets a bit uncomfortable. You see, the people of God, they don't want to hear what God has to say. And this makes Jeremiah that guy every time he opens his mouth. It starts off innocently enough. When Jeremiah is just a young boy, the Lord speaks to him and offers him this plumb position as a spokesperson of God. Sounds like a great gig, doesn't it? Become a member of the clergy class. You get to wear all those cool robes and hats and you just work one day a week. Sweet. Where do I sign? But Jeremiah, he isn't so anxious to take God up on this. Instead, in true God follower form, he declines God's generous offer, saying that he's, he's too young and he can't really speak that well. God would do much better with someone else, thank you very much. But that's where God speaks into Jeremiah's doubts with strong words of comfort and commission. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Have you ever been told that? When, when a deal sounds too good to be true, that it probably is. It's sort of like that for Jeremiah, too. God's call is amazing, and it's empowering, but there's a catch. Jeremiah will be bringing a word of judgment and condemnation to God's people. He's going to be the turn or burn guy. How does the call of God sound now? And why does God need to speak a word of judgment to his people? In the long relational legacy of God and God's people, there is this story thread that remains consistent throughout time. From the time of Abraham, when God promises that he would be their God and they would be his people, the pattern of relationship swings from times when, when God's people are faithful and following God to other times when God's people become unfaithful and they choose to follow other gods. In the latter circumstances, God remains faithful by entering in to speak a word of love by calling his people to repentance and amendment of their ways, bringing people back into that covenant relationship. No matter how far God's people go, God remains faithful. God remains faithful in today's story too. In Jeremiah's time, God's people are they're in that unfaithful category. 
they have become apathetic in their relationship with God. The political and religious leaders of the day, they look the other way when people of God begin to adopt the gods of the religions of the region where they live. And they fall away from worshiping God of their forefathers. A little less time in the temple, a little less time in prayer, a little more time in the marketplace and the workplace instead. It seems innocent enough, but not to God. The people's hearts are unfaithful, and that's not okay. It's time to get them back. Jeremiah, you're on. Tell them that if they don't return to the Lord and forsake all of the other gods they've accumulated, the temple in Jerusalem will be destroyed and they will be taken into captivity by a powerful army from the north. Their sins will bring them down. Point that out to them. Show them their errors. Call them to repentance. That's your job, Jeremiah. Now get to it. Remember how we started this sermon? Remember that guy? Can you see how Jeremiah becomes that guy to God's people? Come on, who, who among us likes to hear a threatening, condemning word from God? Who likes to be called to repent and change your ways? Isn't God supposed to be love and forgiveness and make my life better? Who wants to listen to a guy like Jeremiah? God's people don't. They refuse to listen to Jeremiah. And what God said will happen, happens. To make a long story short, King Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon, he comes in from the north and he conquers Judah, destroying the temple in Jerusalem and taking God's people into captivity in Babylon for 70 years years. The people's response? God tells Jeremiah that it would be very early on in the story. It's Jeremiah 5, 9. And when your people say, what has the Lord our God done all these things to us? You shall say to them, as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve strangers in the land that is not yours. Take that a foreign army as an agent of God. How do you like them apples? Can you imagine Jeremiah's heartache? He loves his people and he loves God. He is conflicted with his feelings as God's judgment comes to fruition. Throughout Jeremiah's story is this ongoing conversation with God, asking God to show mercy, yet willing to yield and deliver God's, God's harsh words to the people. After years of speaking out and being that guy that the people of God tried to ignore, imprison, impale him to shut him up, finally, Jeremiah cries out to God and curses the day that he was born, hating his life and what God has done to him. Yet, he acknowledges that the word of the Lord is like a fire in his bones, and he is unable not to speak God's word, even if it brings extreme hardship for him personally. He's resigned to be that guy. He remains faithful to God at great personal cost. If only God's people could do the same. Jeremiah speaks the word that the people don't want to hear. They would prefer a word of comfort and hope, especially if it doesn't cost them anything like repentance. Surprisingly, there are religious leaders who are more than willing to tell the people what they want to hear. In our text for today, we find that very thing happening. The people of God have been in exile in Babylon for years, and they see no end to the reality in the foreseeable future, despite 
God's word through Jeremiah. Into this, another prophet, Hananiah, speaks to the people, declaring a new word of the Lord. Instead of calling the people to repentance, which is very unpopular, this new word is simply that God will relieve their burden by breaking the yoke of bondage to the king of Babylon. Good news! Suffering will end. Within a couple of years, we will get back to our homes. The temple will be restored. Everything we've been hoping for will happen. God will deliver us. Yay, Hananiah. Yay, God. It's what the people want to hear. The only problem is that isn't the true word of the Lord. It's a lie. But it's what the people like to hear. It just shows that the people's hearts are still far off. Covenant relationship remains broken, and God's exile remains intact until a full 70 years of exile are complete. Sin has its consequences, and the people will pay for their sins. But is that the end of the story? Is that how God works for us too? Are we stuck in our sins only to hear the unpopular word of condemnation from God through a person like me? Yes. God's judgment for sin still remains as true today as if it was in Jeremiah's time. And no, God deals with people like you and me in a very different way. Here is what God has decided to do. These days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. God changes the rules. God takes it upon himself to free his people from their bondage. God does for God's people what they cannot, will not do for themselves. God will make it happen and has. To you, this current generation of simple, apathetic, I've got something more important to do than go to church people, God is faithful. God comes to you and for you, not in some prophet like Jeremiah to bring God's word of judgment, but in Jesus, the living word of God who brings God's word of forgiveness and love. Your sin is real. In Jesus, your sin is forgiven. You are delivered from your bondage. You are released from your captivity. You are restored and given new life. God has done it. God is faithful. So, what do we do with all of this? What does that mean for our lives together? I think there are at least three things that we can do. First, repent. That's right, repent. Get over yourselves, admit your sin, admit your selfishness, and change your ways. Follow God even when it's not convenient. The wages of sin is death, and it's as serious today as in Jeremiah's time. Today is your day. Like Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's still a part of Christian living. 
trust God and make the changes in your life. Second, believe the gospel. Feeling condemned for your sin is only part of the story. Embrace God's amazing love for you in Jesus and live into that freedom that Jesus gives you. You are now free to serve others instead of yourself. You're free to turn outward and love God and your neighbor. Be the person who loves the unlovable. Why? Because God first loved us. Love isn't a feeling, it's an action. An action by those who have been set free by Jesus' love. Third, be a Jeremiah to the people you love. Speak a word of correction to those who are sinning. Speak God's word of change where you see injustice. Help restore covenant community by speaking truth in love. Let law and gospel flow from your lips into the communities of faith that are a part of your life. Don't let your friends get taken into captivity in Babylon. Help the ones you love to live faithfully in response to what God has done for us in Jesus. Imagine a world where God's people live in faithful covenant community, loving God and loving their neighbors as themselves. Imagine a people who dare to speak into people's lives as they hold themselves accountable to the same covenant community expectations. Imagine a people who live a life of love so that the whole world can see in them the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Imagine being that person. Amen. Now, as we continue in place of the Apostles' Creed, having our leaders here, uh, King of Kings, share their faith stories, we welcome Claire. Uh, good morning, Claire. Good morning. My name is Claire Lex. I've been a member here at King of Kings for 28 years, and I've been a Christian from the day I was born. I have so many reasons that I can testify that Christ is in my life through the good times and the bad. And there's been many of both. We were blessed with five wonderful children who unfortunately we lost one when she was 58, but a wonderful daughter. I've been through surgeries where I have felt the actual presence of God beside me I just feel that God has been with me my entire life. So I go back to my Sunday school. I had a wonderful teacher for Bible school in third grade. And the verse that sticks with me from there is John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. 
I know other verses in the Bible, but I cannot quote chapter and verse. But they're there, and I feel that God was with me through all my husband's trials, that he's been with me through the loss of my husband, my daughter, and I just feel his presence in and around me all the time. I've been blessed with a wonderful church family who are there constantly for me also. I could talk for a long time more saying all the things, individuals that have happened to me, but through it all, Christ has been there with me. I just know that if you believe, God is with you all the time. He is ever present in my life. Thank you, Claire. Yes, God is always present in our lives. That's a good reminder. And now, called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of companionship, encourage our relationships with our siblings in Christ, bless our conversations, shape our shared future, and give us hearts eager to join in the festival shout of praise. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of abundance, you make your creation thrive and grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for our environment and be attuned to where your earth is crying out. Hear us, O Lord. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all. Inspire authorities, judges, and politicians to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear and hope. Meet hate with love and welcome one another as we would welcome you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of care, accompany all who are in deepest need. Comfort those who are sick, lonely, or abandoned. We, especially this morning, we lift up Nancy Bevilacqua, Wendy Borst, Christine Cox, Isabel Gershwin, Sharon Heininger, Florence Kelly, Joy Waller, and our prayers to the family of J.C. Jeff Cook upon his death. We also lift up Charlie Stakem, Diane Drennan, her son Jeremy, and his wife Christine. John Holmes, Al Schultz, Carol Kyson's friend Linda Diamond, Robert Nilsson lifting up Rosaline, and Ann Brooks lifting up her neighbor Nancy. And we lift up all those, Lord, now quietly, those that are in our hearts. Strengthen those who are in prison or awaiting trial. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Hear us, O Lord. Your mercy is great. God of community, we give thanks for these congregations. Give us passion to embrace your ministry, your mission, and the vision to recognize where you are leading us. Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you gather in your embrace all who have died. Keep us steadfast in our faith and renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. And now, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now as a communion feast will be prepared and is a few weeks hence, but in the interim, let us open our hearts and minds and bodies to a spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in this most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and desire to receive you in my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.